Good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces today. Thank you for coming out on a rainy day in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and being a part of our service here at Victory Church. Uh, always good to have you with us. It makes things a lot better when you are in the congregation with us. I appreciate you coming and being a part with us today. We want to continue our teaching on God's plan for the family this morning. We started that last week and it, we found out, uh, much to my chagrin, that it had been many years since we had taught on the family. And so uh, we wanted to do that again. Uh, Beth and I used to do this a, a pretty good bit, uh, traveling to other churches, teaching on the family, training children and, and, and things like that. So haven't haven't done it here in a while. So uh, we wanted to uh, be able to minister that with you we've you know we've learned some things over the years and uh, uh, have learned some things actually since the last time that we taught this so we're going to continue with these things that i believe will be a blessing to you and last week when we started off we uh we looked in genesis chapter one you don't have to turn there right now but uh we looked in genesis chapter one and we noticed that in our bible that there are two institutions that god has ordained and those institutions are the family and the church. Now, the first one that he did was the family. We find that in the Garden of Eden. We find it in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. When God created man, he created him male and female. And he gave them dominion to rule over the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God gave man dominion in the earth. So, it says He did that, and then it says He blessed them. And, and blessed means empowered to prosper. Or he empowered them to be able to exercise the authority or the dominion in the earth. So, in doing that, we looked at, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 1, we found that you, you have the creation in Genesis chapter 1, and then Genesis chapter 2 goes into more detail about how man was made. And then Genesis chapter 3, trouble comes in. We find that authority being turned over. And one of the things that we determined last week is that God's plan, God's divine design to exercise authority in the earth is through a man and a woman joined together. That's the way He designed it. Now, now, listen to me for just a moment. That's His divine design. Does it always work that way? Nope. It, you know, there are a lot of exceptions to that in people's lives. Uh, can you still exercise authority in the earth if you're not married? Well, of course you can. I'm just telling you that the way that His, the initial design to operate in authority in the earth was a man and a woman joined together. Now then, since that time, starting in your Bible in Genesis chapter 3, the enemy has come against that design. And he comes against it in all realms. He comes against it every way he possibly can to break up that system or to take away the authority that God has placed in that, the, the ability or the optimum way of, I, that's a better way to put it, it's the optimum way of exercising authority in the earth. So the enemy comes against that in a myriad of ways to be able to destroy or to compromise a person's ability to exercise authority in the earth. Because when we're exercising authority in the earth, that means the enemy's getting beat. So he doesn't like that. So you can see how, and we looked at many verses of Scripture last week and went into detail about this. And you can go back and listen to last week's to, uh, and, and catch up on that. This week, I want us to start in 1 Peter chapter 3. And I want to look at verse 7 here. I want to look at a particular verse of Scripture kind of as our springboard this morning. I just really like the way that Peter words this here. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, 
giving honor to wife as to the weaker vessel. Now, that doesn't, when it says weaker, that doesn't mean less qualified. That doesn't mean not as smart. He's simply talking about physically as the weaker vessel. He's not talking about ability. And, and this is one of the things that I want to emphasize. There are verses of Scripture in our Bible that talk about in Christ, there is no male and there is no female. There is no Jew and there is no Greek. There is no free and there is no bond. All are equal in Christ. So in Christ, are men and women equal? Yes. But he's talking here to husbands. And he says, husbands, treat your wife as a weaker vessel. In other words, protect her. Okay, that's what that's talking about. Don't make that into anything more than you see right there. Don't, don't try to make that into anything uh, <laughs> in, any more complicated than that. That's what he's talking about. He says, dwell together with them as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. I love that expression. Heirs together of the grace of life. Now, I want you to notice the last part of this verse of Scripture. That your prayers be not hindered. So, apparently, a husband and wife that are not dwelling together in unity, that, that things are not operating like they're supposed to in their marriage, their prayers are hindered. Well, you know, that's a problem. Because we're going to find here in just a few moments that when a husband and wife are standing together in unity, that's tough to beat. As a matter of fact, I believe it's the most powerful force on the planet is the husband and wife in Christ standing together in unity. So would it make sense to you that the enemy would try to attack that? Yes. Now then, I mentioned earlier that the two institutions in our Bible are the family and the church. And I mentioned this last week, but it bears repeating. Your attacks in your life are primarily going to come in your family and where your church is concerned. The enemy is going to try to get husbands and wives pitted against each other. Uh, Beth and I years ago learned this. Whenever we started getting, you know, everybody has disagreements. I mean, are you kidding? I disagree with myself sometimes. I, I mean, every, everybody is going to, you're going to have disagreements because you're two individuals who have, who have, you know, two different wills. You, you know, so you're, you're, you're your own person. So you're going to have disagreements. I made a mistake one time, one time, actually, uh, it would be better to say, one time when I made a mistake, one of my mistakes that I made was this. I, uh, I decided in our living room that I wanted some new furniture. And so I bought it. And it was nice. It was a leather love seat, a leather sofa, and a honking leather recliner guess which piece of that caught my attention yes the recliner and i mean it was this nice mahogany brown it i mean it was really it was flex steel brand you know which is decent furniture it's actually really good furniture and and so i i got this and you know and i and and you know and beth said well you know okay but she said i don't i don't really like it and I said, well, honey, we've wanted to get, you know, a suit like this for a while. And this, this is the color that we want. That, the other suit that, that, that you've liked is, it didn't kind of match what we have. And you, so I went ahead and made the decision and got it. Now, my wife is a sweet woman most of the time. But she did not like that furniture. And she in some way, reminded me of that most every day. Now, it looked good. It sat good. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of leather that you would sit in, and it just, it just would fold up. Oh, it was so nice. As a matter of fact, just thinking about it right now, I, 
a tear comes up, right? And, you know, I, just, I, it, I, I loved it. Well, the thing that I didn't notice about that was that on the sofa, that the sofa was designed to where it basically had three bucket seats. Do you know what I'm talking about? Now, the only problem with bucket seats is not everyone has the same size buckets. So, my little bitty wife, when she, uh, oftentimes, when we'd be there watching TV or something like that, she would like to lay down on the sofa. Well, that was very uncomfortable. There was not a way that she could get comfortable on that. Now, you understand, the two end pieces of that, of that sofa reclined. They were recliners. The love seat was, had recliners. We, 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 had, we had a billion recliners in the room. But it just didn't fit her. And when she would want to lay down there to rest or something like that, it wouldn't fit her. Well, you know, one of the things I've learned over the years, and you would think that I would have figured this out. But I mean, this happened recently. This was like, you know, two years ago. By the way, we no longer have that furniture. We sold it. At half of what we paid for it. I took a hit. But my wife's happy. And you know what we did? The next time we went to buy furniture, we did two things. When we left the house, I said, Sweetheart, we are going to the store today for you to pick out furniture. And we took Amber with us. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a real smart thing to do. So Beth and Amber went through the whole store and picked out, I only, had, I only had one request, and that is I wanted a nice leather recliner. I already had a nice leather recliner, but that's beside the point. But I wanted a nice, and, and, she, could, and, so she, and she got a sofa that if she wants to, she can lay down on it, and it's just really comfortable to her, and she's happy, and I'm happy, and we're all happy. So that's, and, and so what happened was, is I did something. The Bible says this, and we're going to get to this next week, and I probably should have saved this story for next week, but we, we can repeat it. The Bible says, and I know this is going to mess you up, that the woman is the head of the house. I know men think that they are, but that's not what the Bible says. The, woman says, the Bible says that the woman is the head of the house. That means things that, that go the way your house is run, the woman's in charge of it. If you come in and she doesn't want you to have your shoes on, take your shoes off. That it's her. Uh, you know, she she decorates it. She does it. And so I had overstepped my authority on this, and uh, it came back on me. Cost me uh, quite a bit of money, <laughs> as, as, as a matter of fact. So you operate in things, and you're you're going to have differences. But when you have differences like that, you work them out. So we, years ago, so y'all thought I forgot where I was, didn't you? So we, when, when you, we years ago learned this, whenever we find ourselves starting to oppose one another, stop, red flags. We've trained ourselves, red flags go off when that happens. When we start getting spooled up towards one another, and I know y'all are sitting right there thinking, Pastor, that never happens in your household, I'm sure. You are naive. It happens to everybody. Because you have differences of opinion. You have different, way of, you have different ways of looking at things. I, 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 I got another story. We left here one day. We're, we're riding. Uh, we have left. We go eat usually at the same place every week. After church, our whole family goes and we have a big time. And so we're leaving, going home, and we're, I didn't tell this last week, did I? And so we're in Beth's little SUV, and, and we're riding, to, and there's a car that pulls up next to us that's a red vehicle. I still don't know what kind of car it was, but it was a red vehicle. So Beth looked at it, she said, you know, that, that's, a, that's a pretty red. She likes red vehicles. That's a pretty red. I said, yes, honey, it is. I said, my truck is a pretty red. I love the color of my truck. And so we're so we're riding. We we've left this car in our dust. I, I mean, I mean, we've pulled ahead of this car. And we're we're in front of it. And uh, so we're riding down the road. And and I said, um, uh, well, I said Nissan. 
has a pretty red also. And I pointed. And she said, I can't see what you're pointing at. I said, Nissan has a pretty red also. She said, I, I can't tell what you're pointing at. Okay, now I know at this point, I've been married to this woman long enough. We have to start rephrasing this. It, you can't just keep saying what I'm saying. It's not registering. And that's, that's a problem a lot of times in arguments, is you keep saying the same thing, and you keep trying to make your point instead of communicating with the person. Do you know that that's one of the main problems in marriages is lack of communication or improper communication? You ha there is an art to communicating. Men are easy to communicate with. Men communicate with each other in grunts. Okay? It's, it, you know, our vocabulary is just not very much. M you know, the average man has a vocabulary of 3,000 words. Average woman has a vocabulary of 80,000, at least. At least. Maybe more than that. And, and, and men just, you know, I, I can be talking to my son, and he can say two or three words, and I already know what he's going to say, and I answer him, and we're done with the conversation. And my wife sits there. She has no idea what's just happened because she wants detail. She wants context. There have been times that I have been walking through the living room and started to tell my wife something and stopped and went, nope, it's not worth it. it it's not worth how long this is going to take to explain this. So we're riding down. So I, point, I said, and Nissan has a pretty red also. I can't tell what you're pointing at. Okay, Beth, do you see a red vehicle on the road? She said, yes. How many red vehicles do you see? She said, one. Then which one do you think I'm pointing at? She said, I didn't know it was a Nissan. <laughs> okay. You see, I was focusing in on red. Because I thought that's what the conversation was about. She focused in on the make of the car. Was she wrong? Nope. Did we look at it two entirely different ways? Yes. Were we communicating? No. Who was wrong? Neither one of us. Point being, there are times that you may have problems communicating with your spouse and it's not anybody's fault. You just look at things differently. I, I, one of the things that I learned years ago, my goodness, this helped me so much. I remember the, the day, I remember when it happened. I remember the day that I made the decision, I'm going to listen to what my wife says. <laughs> because one of the things, that's good preaching right there, wasn't it? That's where the amen went, ladies, right there. That's where the amen went. Now see, women will amen you. You say something like that to the men and they just, they just kind of sit there. They think their wife will get mad at them or something. So, but but I, I remember I learned years ago when I was learning about this. When Beth and I were first married, I, you know, I wanted to be the spiritual leader of the household. So I, that's what I was trying to do. And, 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 and so there were times that I would make, the, make decisions on what I call bulldog faith. And that is, bless God, we're going to do this. I don't care, you know, uh, I, I, I don't care. We're, we're going to make a decision and do this. And Beth would have, she would say something like, you know, you might want to consider doing so-and-so. And my attitude was, that's okay, woman, I got this. Now, I didn't say that, but that was my attitude. And, and so, you know, would you, and, and so I'd get in the middle of it and realize, you know, it probably would have been better if I'd have done it the way she said to do it. And so I remember standing in our little bitty house out in Pinson, Alabama, and I remember standing in our living room when I got this revelation that she is my helpmate. We're in this together. She sees things differently than I do. Now, that's, <laughs> that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It gives you different perspective. It's always better to have additional perspective on something. You make better decisions. And so what I have learned over the years is to trust her is to listen when she has what would seem to be some little off-cuff suggestion. I've learned to pay attention to that, and I have found that things work a whole lot better like that, and there's greater success. 
because you're working together as a team. The enemy doesn't want you working together as a team, so he will pitch you against one another. When you see that happen, stop. It is not worth the fight you're about to get into. Because now, the next step is you start saying things that you're going to regret. And those words that you start saying, the book of Proverbs says, that they will cut or wound a spirit. That you can wound somebody's spirit with words that you speak. And so now then what happens is because of pride, you want to win the argument. So you will pull out all the ammunition you've got to win the argument and prove you were right. Let me share something with you. Being right isn't the objective. Being right is not the objective. Men, have you figured out you can't win an argument with your wife? I mean, come on. Hadn't you figured that out by now? You can't do it. I, I, I saw a thing. I saw a thing one time that, that said, it was just a little cartoon drawing that said, uh, congratulations to the first man that won an argument with his wife. And he's sleeping outside in a tent with his dog. <laughs> It, it, you, you're just you're you're not you're not very well equipped because of the way that we speak and the way that we think. You get into your you, you get into an argument with your wife and you think you're doing a real good job and and you just she'll get you so frustrated that I mean you'll start pulling out you know you'll start bringing up her past your past anybody's past you'll start pulling all kinds of stuff out so that you can win the argument. That is the epitome of pride. Pride comes before destruction. <laughs> And a haughty spirit before a fall. You're headed for a fall when you get into that. So that's what the enemy's doing. He's bringing things in to spool you up against one another. So you have to recognize that. Stop! It is not worth arguing and getting out of unity with one another. We just read that when you operate together, your prayers are not hindered. Do you want your prayers hindered? Do you want your faith not working because you're, you're butting heads with your spouse? No. Be smart enough to recognize that. Most arguments stem from selfishness anyway. Okay? Not all, but most of them stem from selfishness. You need to get your way. And let me, let me share something else with you here. We're just shucking the corn this morning. Is that okay? Y'all didn't realize all of this was in 1 Peter 3, 7, did you? you yeah, it is. It's all, it's all in there. It's what you have me for. One of the things that you have to realize where this is concerned is that the two of you working together in unity is a powerful thing that defeats the enemy. And so, when a person starts operating in selfishness, remember, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. So when you're operating selfishly, the Bible says that faith works by love. It stops your faith. It hinders your faith when you're doing it. Well, the enemy knows that the two of you standing together in agreement are going to beat his brains out. So he will bring things in to divide and conquer. We looked at that last to get you pitted against one another. Stop. There are sometimes, you know, after you've after you've repeated the same thing about three times to each other, you ought to stop right there. And say, you know, we just probably need to quit talking about this and be done with it and go. Don't get mad. Don't hold a grudge for three days. Recognize what it is that the enemy is trying to do to you. And then don't stand for it. Heirs together of the grace of life. Now, in I, we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 24. Turn to Proverbs 24 with me. I want to remind you of a verse of Scripture as you're turning to Proverbs 24, 3. 
I want to remind you, you right, make a note of this. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says that all the promises of God in Him, that's Jesus, are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God. So the promises of God that you find in the Old Testament because you're in Christ, they apply to you also. So as we're reading some of the Old Testament verses of Scripture, realize that in Christ those promises apply to you. Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. Through wisdom, a house is built. This word house here is household. Through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. This is giving you an example of a household built being built. And I want you to notice the thing that it stresses there. It stresses that it's built in wisdom. Now, you can make a footnote in your Bible if you would like to, where this is concerned, and that's Proverbs 9, 10. Before the service, when I was talking to you about some things, I mentioned to this, but those of you listening didn't hear me talking about that. See, oftentimes before I get up here, I have little mini-sermons that are just to the people that are here in the congregation. So, they heard a little extra tidbit that you haven't heard yet, but I'm going to, feel, I'm going to catch you up. And that would be Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. Proverbs 9, 10 is where it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, one of the things, and actually I got this from my little bitty wife years ago. Uh, she, one, one day we were talking and, and she said, You know, the fear of the Lord, I believe, is, is best defined as to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. And I thought to myself, that man, that is really good. If you want to know about the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom is, okay, the beginning of wisdom is, love, this is if you're wise, love what God loves and hate what God hates. Now, how do you know what God loves? And how do you know what God hates? Well, you can go to the Word and find out. what. He, now listen, don't try to justify bad behavior. Okay? If it, Listen, the reason that this is important is because the reason you love what God loves is because, remember we looked in Ephesians chapter 3 last week, uh, I bow my knees to the Father of, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. When, when the Bible talks about, it, it uses several different analogies to compare or to re reference the church. Uh, one of them is an army. Uh, but by far, the example that's used throughout our Bible is that of a family. That's one of the things that the Pharisees and Sadducees had such a hard time with Jesus about. It's because He referred to God as His Father. They had never referred to God as Father. They believed that God was, you know, I mean, yes, I mean, He may... He may be loved, but He doesn't show it very often. He's just waiting to... Man, if you step out of line, He's going to beat you over the head. And Jesus is revealing the nature of the Father, uh, uh, revealing the nature of God, and refers to Him as Father. So the relationship that we have in the church, the relationship that we have with God, is not that of a business, a corporation. It, it is that of a family. And the patriarch of our family is love. Doesn't the Bible say that God is love? So if that's His nature, and that's who He is, then that characteristic should be in us. If we are born of God, then you can, you can substitute by the transitive law of equality. See, you thought you'd never use that again. If God is love and we're in God, then we're in love. If we're born of God, and God is love, then we're born of love. Well, if you're born of love, love should be your nature. So the enemy attacks to get you out of that, to take your power away from you. And he does that, the opposite of love again, is selfishness. You wanting your way. Or... This is what I was going to say a while ago. One of the things that you need to realize where a marriage is concerned, well, I've got rights. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't have rights. 
Your job, listen to me, I'm, 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 I'm helping you here. Our job in a marriage is to serve the other person. Not demand what we get. It's to serve the other person. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I want you to look down with me at, actually what I want to do is I want to, have we got our love confession back there fairly readily available? I know I put you on the spot, but man, our, our people back there, they're so quick. Let's take a look at our love confession. My goodness, we do have it up there. Can y'all see that okay? Okay. Actually, I want y'all to do this with me, okay? Stand up with me. Let's all say this. To, can you read that? Is that big enough for you to read? I've got it written here in my... Okay. Let's all do this together. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious. It does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. For it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. Y'all thought I was going to repeat that again, didn't you? It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person, its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails, never fades out, or becomes obsolete, or comes to an end. Amen. You can be seated. That is at the core of your marriage. This right here. The opposite of these things that we've just listed is selfishness. And it will hinder your faith from working. Now, what happens when things are operating the way that they're supposed to? It's really interesting. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 30 tells us uh, something here that's really good to know. Deuteronomy 32, 30. It says, How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? For the rock is, notice the little rock in the next verse, for their rock is not like our rock. So it's talking about when God is your rock, that one will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to flight. A, the, the joining together of a man, and what we actually have this, those of you that I have, have performed your wedding ceremony, this is actually in, the wedding vows, when we're, uh, it, during the wedding ceremony, we actually refer to this. And that is, when God is, is your rock, then as a married couple, your power increases exponentially. It, it's not just added. One can put a thousand, another put a thousand, so the two of you together can put two thousand. Nope. The two of you together in agreement can defeat ten thousand. Now, another principle of this is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9. Ecclesiastes 4, 9. It says, two are better than one. Remember, Ecclesiastes has, these are, these are writings of Solomon. This is just kind of like, you know, you'd be thinking something and a, and a thought would come to your mind. And you go, oh, that's good, I'll write that. You know, there's such famous verses in here as the one that says, wherever a tree falls, there it is. Yeah, I mean, that's, come on, that, that's profound. Yeah, yeah, that's in Ecclesiastes, it's in your Bible. 
So, here's another one of those gems. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, not beat them down. Not tell them, yeah, I told you I was right and that was going to happen. For if they fall, one would lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And look at the end of verse 12 here. And a three fold cord is not quickly or easily broken. Now that threefold cord is referring to a husband, a wife, and the Lord. And the three operating together, that cord is not easily broken. So wouldn't it make sense to you that the enemy would try to divide that cord? He would try to divide you from God, or he would try to divide you from one another. The reason that I keep emphasizing this is because you have got to learn to recognize this strategy. You have got to learn to recognize when the enemy starts pitting you against one another what he's trying to do. Don't fall for it. Now I know sometimes it feels good to your flesh to argue with people. I understand that. But it's not worth what it will cost you. Now, when things are operating in your life like they're supposed to, the thing that, that's desired is to leave or to build a legacy. You're wanting to influence other people with the goodness of God. Have you ever noticed that some families, that their name is a byword for calamity or criminal behavior or poverty? And other families are known for education or philanthropy or wealth or godliness. What do you want to leave behind you, generations? Psalm 112, verse 1. says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Love what God loves. Hate what God hates. Who delights greatly in His commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 13. We like to usually, we like to oftentimes go to verse 17 in this particular uh, passage of scripture. But I want you to look at the verses that precede it. Isaiah 54, 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. When you teach your children the ways of God, what happens to them? What's a side product? They're peaceful. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me, whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. In other words, if they, if they assemble to come against you, and you're in me, they're going to fall. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows coals in the fire, brings forth an instrument for his work. I have created the spoiler to destroy. Verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Now, isn't that something you want to pass to your children? Isn't that something you want to have operating in your family? This verse of Scripture, the beginning of verse 17, can be used for a lot of things. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Now, that's a good thing. No weapon formed against you. Anything that the enemy would try to bring against you will not prosper. And then I want you to look with me here in Deuteronomy chapter 30. So, 
how do you establish your family? How does this occur? In Deuteronomy chapter 30, and then this happens again over in Joshua chapter 8, but we're going to look at the first example. The book of Deuteronomy, Moses is retelling or re-giving the law to the children of Israel. Because of sin, they have been in the wilderness, and they have uh, wandered around in the wilderness. They haven't gone in, and uh, those people, that generation has died off. And because that generation has died off now, the, their children are now able to go into the land. But before they go, Moses is retelling them the law that was given on Mount Sinai. We're getting a refresher course. So he's got them together. That's what the book Deuteronomy means. And so we've gotten to this point here in Deuteronomy 30, chapter 19. They are out... Moses has gathered the people together, and they are in the valley of Shechem. And so you have this area that's flat, valley, it's flat. And to the north, you have Mount Ebal. And to the south, you have Mount Gerizim. So you have half of the children of Israel that are on Mount Ebal, half of the children of Israel that are on Mount Gerizim. Moses and the priest are in the valley with the Ark of the Covenant. And so Moses is talking, <laughs> yelling to the people on the mountain. And he says, I called heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death. Blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Now what we find is, is if you know in Deuteronomy chapter 28, this is also in our wedding vow. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, the very beginning of Deuteronomy 28 are the blessings of the law. If you obey the law, these good things happen to you. And then the last part, of that chapter, Deuteronomy 28. And if you don't obey my commandments, these things happen to you. Now, being familiar with Deuteronomy 28 is really good because the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 that we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. So the things that are under the curse in Deuteronomy 28, you've been redeemed from. So it's good to know those things. Well, at this time, what would happen is is you had the, the nation of Israel was divided into two different groups of people, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. So what they would do is they would say Deuteronomy 28 back and forth to each other. And Mount Ebal, the mountain on the north, would they would pronounce the curses of the law. And the group on Mount Gerizim, they would pronounce the blessings. And so it would go back and forth. Curses, blessing. Curses, blessing. And so forth and so on. Then Moses, after they have done that, says, I call you today to record or as witnesses today that I have set before you life and death. Blessing, cursing. So that's what they've just done. He said... For those of you that are a little slow, choose the life part. Choose the blessing part. Now then I want you to notice in that, who does the choosing for you? We do. God doesn't do the choosing for you. You choose. That both you and your descendants may live. So, parents... It's up to you. You're going to be choosing life and death, blessing and cursing in your household to pass on to your children. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. 
Now, one of the things I want to conclude with, I want to uh, address as we conclude here this morning is this. And this is something that you be mindful of because we forget this on occasion. I'm talking about the way that to optimum efficiency that your household is supposed to work. How many of you know in your life that, that your life needs to be arranged in certain priorities? You know, the, the number one priority in your life is not football or fishing or golf. The number one priority in your life is your relationship with God. That's number one. Number one. Now then, where your family is concerned. And this is usually an area that I get some kickback on. But I'm sharing with you what the Word says because I want you operating in power and faith and dominion, exercising authority in the earth and walking in, very, in God's very best in your life. In your household, your number one relationship is with God. Number one. If you don't have God at the center of your relationship, there are going to be problems. The next priority in your household is your spouse. This is where, this is where we start getting kicked back here. Have you ever heard the, you heard the expression, well, you know, brother, it's just family first. <laughs> no, it's not. It's God first. God first, then your family. And in your family, it is your spouse, your children, and your parents. That order. Now, one of the things that I see happening is this. As a matter of fact, I can think of four families right off the top of my head that this has happened to in this church, and they're gone. And it happened because of this. That is, that their children were the number one thing. And they made the children the center of their lives. Now listen, are children important? Yes. I'm not telling you to tell your four-year-old, hey, you're on your own, kid. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But like in, in my household, every year since I have been married, the first Christmas present that I buy is my wife's. Because if there's anybody that's getting a Christmas present from me, it's my wife. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, you should take your money and make sure the children have theirs. I didn't say they went without. I said she's first. And my children know she's first. And today, my children know that my wife comes first. And my grandchildren know that their Mimi comes first where I'm concerned. And the reason is, is I am in a blood covenant relationship with that woman. I have been joined. The two of us are one. Next to God, she's the most important person in my life. And that's the way I treat her. And that's the way she treats me. And what that provides for our children is an example. It provides security. If it's not done that way, what children, they want, they grow up thinking they are the center of attention. And guess what? When they get older, your little sunshine's going to find out they are not the center of the universe. And likely whoever they find that out from is not going to be near as gentle or walk in love towards them the way that you would. It's better if they find that out from you. When you have children, your children are added in to your family. The family doesn't shift and center everything around them. Now, now listen, we're not going to get goofy about this, okay? Yes, there are times that you have to give attention and more attention to your children because they are more needy. You know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, your 8-month-old baby may be hungry. 
Well, you have to tend to the needs of that child. It's, you know, don't get goofy with me here. What I'm talking about is the, is the flow in the family, the way that the family is supposed to work. Now, where I see this happen, where people run into this, and I'm going to make a really bold statement here. You can get mad if you want to, but it needs to be said, and I'm going to say it. Where I see this happen a lot of times is in second marriages. You come, and I understand it, okay? I, I, I understand. You come into a second marriage, and there is, there is the natural desire to protect your children in that marriage. Okay, listen to me. Are you sitting down? If you are considering getting remarried and you cannot put your spouse first, don't get married. I know. I can already see the comments coming in now. When we get to heaven, you ask Jesus, He'll tell you I was right. You have got to have that relationship. We're going to talk about this next week. If you don't, it cuts the flow of authority in your household. It messes things up. That's one of the reasons I believe, this is my personal opinion, that you know the divorce rate in this country for decades has been right at 50%. But when somebody is divorced one time, that rate goes up. The second marriage, 75% is the divorce rate. Several reasons. Number one, whatever the problem was in the first one didn't get fixed. And so it's now drug in to the second marriage. The second thing that happens is what I just shared with you, and that is that the two people not getting along and, and, and giving the other the honor and respect that they should have. Remember, God first. Then your spouse then your children, then your parents. See, you know, the middle portion of life, your parents don't need a whole lot. But as they start getting older, they do. And there's gonna, it's going to be a time in your life that you're going to have to start taking care of your parents more and more, and so your attention shifts there. But the importance of doing that does not override your spouse or your children. You just have to juggle your time. Now, this is really important. And the reason that it's important is remember all of this, we've started off last week and we started off today talking about this all has to do with the exercising of authority in the earth. So things have to be in order for you to be able to exercise authority, power, and dominion in the earth the way that God has called you to, do, to exercise that. Amen? Amen. Okay. Three of you agree with that. All right. Okay. No, I know what you're chewing over it. We're going to stop there for today. Next week, my little bitty wife's going to be joining me up here, and we're going to uh, talk about relationships of, uh, of husband and wife. If, if you noticed, I haven't been talking a whole lot about submission. I'm saving that for her to, to talk about that, because if you get mad, I'd rather you be mad at her than to be mad at me. Actually, she just has a wonderful perspective on it, and does an excellent job of explaining it and, and talking about how to operate in that. That's that just really incredible. So I encourage you to be here next week. I encourage you to invite friends to be with you, people that need to hear this. You can probably think of four or five couples that need to hear this just off the top of your head. So I encourage you to, to be here. It's going to be really good. Well, my desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there's victory in Jesus. Amen.